Space flight speaks to something deep inside us. Many of us, if not all. An emerging cosmic perspective. An improved understanding of our place in the universe. A highly visible program affecting our view of ourselves might clarify the fragility of our planetary environment and the common peril and responsibility of all the nations and peoples of Earth. And human missions to Mars would provide hopeful prospects, rich in adventure, for the wanderers among us, especially the young. Even vicarious exploration has social utility. It's no accident that whatever their human flaws, and however moribund the human space program has become, astronauts and cosmonauts are still widely regarded as heroes of our species. A scientific colleague tells me about a recent trip to the New Guinea highlands, where she visited a Stone Age culture hardly contacted by Western civilization. They were ignorant of uh, wristwatches, soft drinks, frozen food. But they knew about Apollo 11. They knew that humans had walked on the moon. They knew the names of Armstrong and Aldrin and the Collins. They wanted to know who was visiting the moon these days. Winning a foothold on other worlds whispers in our ears that we're more than Picts or Serbs or Tongans. We're humans. Exploratory spaceflight puts scientific ideas, scientific thinking, and scientific vocabulary in the public eye. It elevates the general level of intellectual inquiry. The idea that we've now understood something never grasped by anybody who ever lived before. That exhilaration especially intense for the scientists involved, but perceptible to nearly everybody. Propagates through the society, bounces off walls, and comes back at us. It encourages us to address problems in other fields that have also never been solved. It increases the general sense of optimism in the society. It gives currency to critical thinking of the sort urgently needed if we're going to solve hitherto intractable social issues. It helps stimulate a new generation of scientists. The more science in the media, the healthier, I believe, the society is. People everywhere hunger to understand. When I was a child, my most exultant dreams were about flying. Not in some machine, but all by myself. I'd be uh, skipping or hopping, and slowly I could pull my trajectory higher. It would take longer to fall back to the ground. Soon, I'd be on such a high arc that I wouldn't come down at all. I would alight like um, a gargoyle in a niche near the pinnacle of a skyscraper. Or I'd gently settle down on a cloud. In the dream which I must have had in its many variations at least a hundred times. Achieving flight required a certain cast of mind. It's impossible to describe it in words, but I can remember what it was like to this day. You did something inside your head and at the pit of your stomach, and then you could lift yourself up by, by an effort of will alone, your limbs hanging limply off you'd soar. I know many people have had similar dreams. Maybe most people. Maybe everyone. Perhaps it goes back ten million years or more when our ancestors were gracefully flinging themselves from branch to branch in the primeval forest. A wish to soar like the birds motivated many of the pioneers of flight, including Leonardo da Vinci and the Wright brothers. Maybe that's part of the appeal of spaceflight, too. In orbit around any world, or in interplanetary flight, you're literally weightless. You can propel yourself to the spacecraft ceiling with a slight push off the floor. 
you can go tumbling through the air down the long axis of the spacecraft. Humans experience weightlessness as joy. This has been reported by almost every astronaut and cosmonaut. But because spacecraft are still so small, and because space walks have been done with extreme caution, no human has yet enjoyed this wonder and glory. Propelling yourself by an almost imperceptible push, with no machinery driving you, untethered, eventually with no spacecraft in sight, high up into the sky, into the blackness of interplanetary space. You become a living satellite of the Earth, or a human planet of the Sun. Planetary exploration satisfies our inclination for great enterprises and wanderings and quests that has been with us since our days as hunters and gatherers on the East African savannas a million years ago. By chance, it is possible, I say, to imagine many schemes of historical causality in which this would not have transpired. In our age, we're able to begin again. Exploring other worlds employs precisely the same qualities of daring, planning, cooperative enterprise, and valor that mark the finest in the military tradition. Never mind the night launch of an Apollo spacecraft bound for another world. That makes the conclusion foregone. Witness Muir F-14s taking off from adjacent flight decks, gracefully canting left and right, afterburners flaming. And there's something that sweeps you away. Or at least it does me. And no amount of knowledge of the potential abuses of carrier task forces can affect the depth of that feeling. It simply speaks to another part of me. It doesn't want recriminations or politics. It just wants to fly. The philosopher Bertrand Russell, in 1959, wrote as follows. The future possibilities of space travel, which are now left mainly to unfounded fantasy, could be more soberly treated without ceasing to be interesting and could show to even the most adventurous of the young that a world without war need not be a world without adventurous and hazardous glory. To this kind of contest there is no limit. Each victory is only a prelude to another and no boundaries can be set to rational hope. Russell's phrase is, is noteworthy, adventurous and hazardous glory. Even if we could make human spaceflight risk-free, and of course we can't, it might be counterproductive. The hazard is an inseparable component of the glory. In the meantime, the most important step we can take toward Mars is to make significant progress on Earth. Even modest improvements in the social, economic, and political problems that our global civilization now faces could release enormous resources, both material and human, for other goals. There's plenty of housework to be done down here on Earth, and our commitment to it must be steadfast. But we're the kind of species that needs a frontier for fundamental biological reasons. Every time humanity stretches itself and turns a new corner, it receives a jolt of productive vitality that can carry it for centuries. There's a new world next door, and we know how to get there.